Hi, I'm <laughs> very funny. Hi, I'm Wally Petrajic. I, I, I just work here. So, um, what I'd like to have all the, we're looking at the voices, the the, the programming vision, uh, the the embodiment of the Beatles channel in particular, but also the attitude of, of Sirius, frankly, of giving you opportunities to hear something uh, that you say, oh boy, this is radio the way I always wanted it to be. Uh, so with that as your softball opening, could you give us a little bit of background about how the Beatles channel came to be and how that fits into the overall makeup, not only of Sirius then, but Sirius now? Well, Sirius XM has had partner channels for quite a while. The Beatles channel started in 2017, uh, but prior to that, that we had uh, the Springsteen channel and Grateful Dead channel and some others that I can't remember. So, it, you know, people would always ask, uh, "Why don't you have a Beatles channel?" And Tom Petty, yep. We, I mean, we have we have a lot now. We have yeah, Elvis was part of that too. Um, but eventually, you know, it took a little while, but eventually. Uh, we, we, we have a partnership with Apple, and it came to be in 2017, and we haven't looked back, so. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. The dream of all of us is to be a part of something bigger, and no one embodies that better than, I want to do it, give it all, I'm going to do it. Caitlin, tell us a little bit about your story. Oh, geez, where do I begin? Well, lifelong Beatle maniac. If it weren't for the Beatles, I wouldn't be here. Um, yes. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> My mother, ladies and gentlemen. Um, okay. And so, I've dabbled in radio throughout my life, um, but before that I was also working as the memorabilia tour guide at Hard Rock International, giving tours of Beatles memorabilia. So that's kind of how I got into it, and then I started making content on YouTube, which then transferred in 2020 to the TikTok grades. And so I thought, you know, I would do On This Day in Beatles history every single day, and it kind of gave me this audience. And after a year or so of doing that, I was like, well, do I really want to do it all over again? No. So I was sitting at my desk at work one day, because that's where I get all my best ideas. And On someone else's time. <laughs> exactly. And I said, well, the Beatles at that point aren't on TikTok yet. What's something that I could do that incorporates what I love to do with radio and the Beatles? And so I just looked up to see if Sirius XM had a TikTok account. And lo and behold, there it was. And I was like, I have an idea. I'm gonna make fake air breaks every day until this guy notices. <laughs> and it took me nine days. Wow. Nine days. And then I got a DM from Mr. Saltzman here saying, I love your energy, let's set up a meeting. And now it's been two years later that I've been on the Beatles channel. Dream come true. Congratulations. Thank you. David, we, we dropped besides Beatles, uh, Tom Petty, etc. So you have worn a number of hats over the years. Let's focus your hat specifically on the serious world. What do you do there? Well, I act, I'm kind of a minister without portfolio because I work across a number of channels. Uh, obviously, I'm on the Beatles channel with uh, Tom for Apple Jam and I get to hang out at the Fab Forum every now and then, and I've done some stuff, you know, whenever whenever something needed to be done. But I also have a weekly show on Tom Petty Radio. I have my own program on the Spectrum that I curate called The Writer's Block, in which I basically, it's as I describe it, it's a radio show about writing, about music, because I am by uh, original profession a journalist and critic, so I get to do everything that I did and do in print on the air. But I did start out in college on the radio, and my whole trip was really via radio, writing in school, and then when I got out, I worked in concert promotion, I did publicity for clubs, um, a lot of different aspects of the business. 
before I settled on writing, eventually moved to New York out of Philly in uh, 78, and was lucky enough to get some breaks that I didn't waste, and had a very long run at Rolling Stone. But um, in 2015, um, I was laid off, and but you know, in a in this gentlest way possible. Um, but it was right at that point that. Uh, one of the executives at uh, Sirius, Steve Bladder, I'd met him before, and we had a meeting, and he said, what would you like to do? And I said, well, I'm not entirely sure, but let me think about it. So I came up with this idea of a radio show about writing, about music, which means playing records, thematic things, tributes to artists, interviews, and he said, well, let's put you on the air and see what happens. And it's almost nine years now. Thank you very much. I should, I should say, I, I first got to see David on TV when you were on MTV I and VH1. Spent, I, I, just said I that spent to him a little too hall. much time on TV as well. I, that's, you know, that's how I got to He's the reason I know so much random stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or random notes. I ended up says. doing a lot of just sort of guest shots and like documentaries. I've been in the Wilco film. Yeah. Um, and doing things, some of these behind the musics and uh, That's the classic album, album classic things. Albums. But one of the things I've always told people is when I do those programs, it's because I have something to say about that artist or that record. I, I don't like being on TV. Yeah. I actually don't like... I became a writer because I didn't want people looking at me. <laughs> and I love radio because nobody is there in the room except him. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... To have that uh, avenue as well, really, I, I treasure the fact that people saw those things, recognized what I brought to them, and that I can still do that, you know, courtesy of Adam and Tom and Caitlin and everybody at Sirius. I can do it on the radio, which is very, where I started. Very good, very good. Um, all right, um, you mentioned him. Let's go one over to yeah. him. him. Um, that guy who, of course, we all know from, so let's start the list of what Tom does uh, for the Beatles channel. Well, what exactly do you do? Ah. It's, 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 trust me, it's quite a list. Um, actually, as many of you know, I've made many, many friends here at the Fest for Beatles Fest. Thank you. And previous at Beatles Fest uh, over the years as your MC, as your trivia host, your name that tune host, your auctioneer, chief cook and bottle washer, basically. Uh, whatever whatever needs fixing here, um, I've been able to uh, partner up with Mark and the, and uh, and his team and really just um, live it all out, which is great. Uh, along the way, I've been writing for Beatle Fan Magazine um, since probably right around 2000. Before that, a uh, fanzine called Good Day Sunshine. So, have, thank you. Um, so between, you know, having been in, in that fan space on, on the fanzines here at the fest, um, you know, kind of along the way, done some radio fill-in things along the way, and kind of became almost like a like a go-to source for a rare record or a comment or a you know a quote or a blurb or something for someone working on a book. And in 2017, and I have to say this, the Beatles channel was put together with the precision and secrecy of a military maneuver. Um, I, I like to think I kind of know what's going on most of the time. I had no idea <laughs> that this was going on. And was having lunch with um, an old friend of mine, Luke Simon, who's our VP of the channel. It was like three days before the channel launched. And he had asked me along the way, like, hey, do you, have, you know those trivia things you do at the fest? Do you have those written down? Like, can we look at that? And I said, yeah, what are you doing? Well, the 60s channel, we're doing some promotion and we're going to do that. Yeah. Or whatever, you know. Uh, what about those name that tune things? And you have those little clips all set? Like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. And what are you doing with the, oh, we're doing a name. Yeah, we're going to do little games on the 60s channel or the oldies channel. Said, yeah, go ahead, whatever. And we were having lunch. It was on a Saturday and between bites of a sandwich I asked him, hey, whatever became of those things I gave you? What'd you, what'd you do with all that? Beetle bites. Yeah, beetle bites. <laughs> and he just looked at me like the color ran out of his face. I said, "You, I swear you better not be telling me what I think you're gonna be telling me. And he didn't tell me, he kept the secret, okay? But he said, 
Jesus, uh, you know, what are you doing Thursday morning? I said, I'm going to work. Why? He says, well, you've got a computer on your desk, I'm sure. I said, yeah. He says, just, you know, pay attention to what's going on Thursday morning. That was when they made the announcement. Um, you know, and I remember asking him, I said, let me put it this way. If I wasn't already a full-fledged, serious subscriber, is something going to happen that if I wasn't a subscriber would make me a subscriber? And he said, let's put it this way. I wouldn't want to be in between you and your checkbook when this <laughs> announcement gets made. I said, all right, I think I know what's going on. So I was excited like everybody was about the channel. I was not part of the initial you know, roster of events or, or shows or anything like that. But among them, and you know, when I saw what was lined up, you know, all these great shows, and it's, you know, how am I going to find time? I want to listen to this all day. This is this is going to be great. And one of the th things that caught my eye was the Fab Forum, a weekly talk show about anything and everything beans. Dennis Elsis, who I've been listening to on radio here in New York for decades, right? yeah. great voice, mm -hmm. um, a big big presence in radio. Bill, who I I actually only knew from seeing him on TV, on, on the CBS uh, News on Sundays when he would do his profiles. And I remembered his name as being a writer for Musician Magazine for many years. Um, and I said, well, that's gonna be good. I can imagine myself calling in every week. And um, before long, I was asked by Lou, he said, you know, that, that Fab Forum thing, you know, is, is working out real well. We have a great host, we have a great, interviewer but you know we want we're thinking of adding a third leg to the stool um and have a, a, a beatles fan beatles expert beatles guy in the room to round that out and would i be interested no hmm. right, no yeah. <laughs> um, so uh i was invited to audition for that we had a fun night interviewing for that um and it worked out well and i was invited to join the forum and that was in 2017. Since then, um, I've added three other shows. Uh, the Way Beyond Compare Rarities show, which uh, debuts every Monday. It's a weekly show. Half hour of B-sides, live tracks, alternate takes, stuff like that. Um, Apple Jam, which I tell people is the show I have to do the most preparation for, even though we only do one new show a month and put it in rotation, because I said, if I don't practice for this, it would look like I was you know, playing golf against Tiger Woods or something. It would really show, you know, when you go up uh, and, and share a microphone with somebody as, as articulate and experienced and knowledgeable as David. Uh, and that's a show I really, really love doing. And we have a new show called Across the Universe, which I write uh, and work with Dennis Elsis on. So um, kind of getting out there uh, quite a bit at the Beatles channel. So Tom is an incredible I'm going to do a couple in the weeds questions because I've got you trapped, you can't leave. So, uh, uh, one of them, and I know you've got this down to a very concise explanation. Sometimes as a fan, you're listening and you go, why did they just uh, play um, to, uh, Band on the Run from track one to the end? Uh, you can't do that. No. But you can do Abbey Road from track one to the end. Yeah. So basically, when you talk about the top secret negotiations and such, without going into all the top secret, secret details, sauce. what what are some of the things that we as listeners should be conscious of? Saying, uh, well, why did Kevin do this, or or or, 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 or why why did why did Tom? Uh, uh, do it's that? all his fault. Right. Well, of course it's all his fault. I say for better or worse. So if you can give us just a share with us just the the, the boil down of what you have to be aware of. Yeah. when you're programming the, uh, the station. Well, the key word is balance. Uh, you know, there's four stars in the Beatles, so we, we treat all four of them, you know, the same way. They're, they're, they're stars. Right. That's right. So it's not just a channel of one, there's a, it's a channel of four of them. And then there's also the Beatles as a collective. So um, as far as the way we have deals worked out, we could play as many Beatles songs as we want in a row, back to back. Uh, there are some other things we have to consider with... Uh, with the solo records, uh, labels, and all that other stuff. So I deal with stuff like that, but there's also a partner that we uh, that we work with, so we'd like to make sure that you know they're happy with what we're doing. And uh, you know, there's just a lot of balance going on. You'll always hear 
um, one solo song from one of the four members an hour. You'll always hear a cover song once an hour. You'll hear um, some, you know an artist that influenced the Beatles once an hour, and then you know then there's all the Beatles songs that get uh, mixed in. So we just try to keep it uh, try to keep it balanced and different. And the things you hear in between the songs is what differentiates <laughs> it as well. Uh, the different uh, audio clips from Paul or different celebrities talking about the Beatles. It's just finding different ways to take 200 something songs uh, and make it different every day. Make them a thousand. That's right. Well, well with the solo records, it's. Yeah, yeah. Solo yeah. Covers, yeah I just, you know, apologies. right. So, there's a lot there, but. Uh, which is, of course, what makes it so engaging for us uh, as fans. Basically, and then we have hosts who are curating their own shows as well as Tom Sippy writes across the universe. Uh, Chris Carter is on in the mornings, uh, Breakfast with the Beatles. We have the great Meg Griffin every day uh, from five to nine uh, Eastern. So there's there's many many hosts on the channel. And by the way, spoken like an excellent promo person. <laughs> um, okay, so that's that's the in the weeds. Basically, they have deals and such that they have to follow certain uh, parameters that they have to follow. And so, uh, my writing partner here at Castleman and I are big fans across the board. And uh, we're going to say, okay, oh, that's how they did that. Or I wonder what in the Apple Jam they're going to juxtapose here to go from this Billy Preston to Doris Troy to. Uh, and I was talking to someone yesterday, he said, well, they're certainly never going to play anything from the Come Together uh, soundtrack on uh, Apple true. Records. And I said, <laughs> guess what? That's not, not true. true. That's so, incredible innovation. Uh, it takes them to play the Dells, one of the great well, yeah, yeah, vocal yeah, groups, so yeah, why not yeah. use it? Exactly. All right, Caitlin, how do you prepare each day? Oh, man. Well, it really is a collaborative effort since Adam is the guy that knows what's going on everywhere all the time. So it's kind of like, well, I don't know how, yeah, 24-8. Yeah, um, <laughs> so um, he kind of gives me a rundown as to what's kind of going on around me since I'm only on for one hour. And so I kind of just pick and choose from there. Like he said, there's, you know, solo songs I can do for, you know, I could pick a John, I could pick a Paul. On Wednesdays, I do Wednesday Wings. Yes. Um, you know, thank you. <laughs> yes, tune in for Wednesday Wings. Um, and it kind of just works out like that. And then I have my spot where I put my cover for Caitlin's Cover Corner and kind of just build from what else is going on around during that time. All right, now. I was just getting my spontaneous, uh, candid shot of me uh, uh, arranged. Um, think of a question or two you might have for uh, this illustrious group, and I will bring uh, the microphone uh, to them. But I want to make sure you all have had a chance to say what you want to say. This is your chance to say, tune in and here's why. Or this is what we're trying to do. Would you, like for instance, Tom gave me a call. What's that? How long has Apple Jam been on? Like two years? Uh, three years? Two years? No, three. We're, we're actually in our fourth year. We're, we're up to oh, show. Right. I think yeah. this is like 30 years. Because it was actually just right around, I think it was kind of, we were in the pandemic. We were started. definitely right in the pandemic. Yeah. 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 The reason I asked that is I get this call from Tom saying, so just uh, how interested are you in something just about Apple? Like, do you have the, no, do you have the Apple box collection? Right. Yeah, I do. Of course, of course, of course, of course I have the yeah. Apple Box yeah. collection yeah. with the uh, artist and all. So, is that something that you'd be interested in hearing more about? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, that, that that's because there's stuff that's not on the collection. So, I'd like to hear that. Oh, okay. Uh, any reason? Oh, no particular reason. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, well, so, so he's got the the the, the top secrecy uh, routine down cold. Mm -hmm. But so, yeah, are there any? No particular reason questions you'd like to toss out to uh, uh, to us. Us to, to you guys? Yeah. Um, the questions, wow, the questions we want to, to ask. To the forum. To the questions yeah. we want to put out to you. Yeah, um, and you can think about it if you need a few, a few moments. Oh, I'm going to have to think about that. 
All right, I've got one. What would you like to hear more of? If, if okay, okay. Like okay. Of? and let's yeah. let's let's establish the parameters. Do you mean type like oldies or or newies? Uh, more solo. In? When you're listening, what, what do you want to, to hear more yeah. of? All right. So, what do you want to hear more of? The B sides. Okay. <laughs> well, what's a B side? Even before you asked them to ask that question, it was perfectly relating to what my question is, okay, which is. Do you uh, survey your audience to get an idea of what they want? Because, and I'll, I'm gonna, for my own personal uh, favorites, gonna say that I love the interviews, the Fab Forum. I love the the, the talk. Um, and unfortunately, I don't get to listen to Beatles radio all day long. So it's usually in the car, and it's at different times of the day. It's not a consistent time of the day. But when I when I'm hearing the Fab Forum or I'm hearing uh, interviews. Uh, that's my favorite thing about the Beatles channel, and that's unique to the Beatles channel. And I'm requesting more of that, but I'm wondering, do you get that information from your listeners to know how much of talk versus music? We, yeah, we do. Um, every year or two, we, we, we take surveys and stuff like that. So we, we, do, we do that. Um, but the, the main thing that we're focusing on right now is our app, which is where every single thing lives that we, that we do. Um, so there's the linear part of it, which is in the car, the radio part of it, and then there's the app, right, the digital part of it. Um, we're basically now, you know, we just, we just launched our new app and there's everything on there that you could ever want to hear. So um, what we are starting to do now is point listeners to the app so that you know that there's a whole ton of content there for you to listen to. We'll be archiving a lot of our interviews, right? So yeah. exactly. the Fab Forum, we might not have let me go see when George from St. Louis called in. But if whoever was our guest that night, Lawrence Juber was our guest, we'll say, boy, I'd like to go get a Lawrence Juber interview again. We'll be, right, we'll, be, mm -hmm. we'll be archiving all that. So people have been asking for that for a while, uh, particularly since I guess the old app, what it, the shows used to be on for a week or two. Right. And then they'd say, oh, but, you know, I didn't have a chance, I was working, I, whatever, I couldn't do it. I said, it, boy, we'd love to know that not just you know the interviews we've done on Fab Forum, but some of the roundtables. David did a, a brilliant one last year on the Mind Games album, which you know I'm just uh, maybe I'm talking out of school here. I don't know, but Mind Games is supposed to be released as a box set this year, right? I got to imagine that that roundtable he did with all the musicians who were on the Mind Games album will be a great something to pull up on the app and you know and kind of guide you through that new box set of all the or outtakes or maybe if you interviewed paul mccartney and you had a show yeah you know, yeah you're right if, if, if anyone ever had a chance to, to what's see, that like yeah what's yeah, it like I'll, I'll i'll tell you what it's like i went home that night made a list of days in my life that sucked <laughs> and the first entry was not today <laughs> That, that's what that was like. Um, yeah, one of the great, great thrills, not just of my time at Sirius, but frankly of my life, um, was getting to spend time with Paul McCartney one afternoon, one-on-one, -on -one in his offices in New York to talk about my very favorite album of his, which is Tug of War from 1982. And Paul, um, people always knew, what was he like? And I said, he's... You make a list of good adjectives, okay? Friendly and focused and engaging and forthcoming and, you know, hospitable and and insightful and all these good adjectives. He was everything you want any interview to be, but certainly when he's your guy, this is, I mean, this, this is it. This is, you know, it's not going to get much bigger than that. Um, he was just terrific and getting a chance to sit with him to talk about not just the, the essence of the album, but then go track by track. I mean, he told Beatles stories that I, I had to look like the kid in The Exorcist when the, the head is going around. <laughs> he was telling Beatles stories I never heard. I mean, and he would have them, right? Mm -hmm. Who's gonna have Beatles stories I never heard? I'm gonna guess Paul. Um, he told some stories and there, there were a couple that just were so good and you know the marching orders I got from my boss here were make sure when you go track by track you get something that whenever we play, pick a song from the album, take it away, you can say, here's what Paul had to say about this song, and get a nice bite. And he didn't just give a bite. He he told us everything we wanted to know. Who was on it, 
why he wrote it, when he wrote it. He, he just gave incredible insight into the making of the album. But then, right? But then, because it was my, my nightmare was he's going to go, oh, I wrote that in five minutes, go to the next song, and I'm going to be running out of questions in 10 minutes. He had a Beatles story seemingly for every track on the album, okay? Um, not hard to make a connection to John Lennon, here today is on that album. Not hard to make a connection to Ringo Starr. Ringo's the drummer on the album. Not hard to make a connection to George Martin. He produced the album. Okay, so there's, there's certainly plenty of Beatles to go around when you're talking about the songs from Tug of War. When he dragged not only George Harrison, but George's parents into the proceedings, I knew I was outmatched. <laughs> um, he, he, he told a great story about George's parents, and you know he talked about Julia, you know, getting her in, you know, Julia, uh, John's mom, in there. He got Brian Epstein into the proceedings. This was, I, I was sitting there saying, we, we've got so much, you know, that, that is just going to be radio gold. And by the way, tonight um, at 6.45 in the video room, um, the interview wasn't filmed. It was only audio recording. And last year, hopefully some of you got to see it when we premiered it uh, at the fest. Um, the good news here is if you don't have Sirius XM, you can get to hear it and hear what we do. If you do have Sirius and didn't miss it and it's not on the app yet, guess what? You can hear it now. And even if you heard it when it was on Sirius, we used about, what, 40 minutes of it, I guess, in the actual uh, special where we interspersed all the songs. This is going to be the uncut hour. Um, and I have to tell you, you know, I wanted so badly for people to hear how focused and how smart and how funny Paul was during this interview. Um, I, I tried by myself to make a video accompaniment so that people weren't looking at their phones and things and listening to this. And frankly, it looked like I made it. It was terrible. Um, but I hired um, this lady up here with the camera, Natalie, who many of you know, uh, has taken photos and done videos here at the fest. Um, and I said, if anyone's got the talent and the sensibilities and the taste to do this, it would be her. Um, gave her the, the materials to work with and she truly put together something you cannot take your eyes off of. Uh, if you have a hole in the schedule tonight, 645 in the video room, we'll be in there to introduce it. I'd invite you all to, to watch it and enjoy it and kind of see what what an afternoon with Paul McCartney sounds like. Uh, so it is, it's an amazing experience. I, I'm going to piggyback on, on your uh, a plug at uh, 815. Uh, I'm, I'm part of a group called Troika. We have a little original uh, theatrical piece. And I'm going to say one of the people on the stage oh, is going to be part of that as well. So I, I invite you to that. David, one, I didn't know. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, and one more thing about what Sirius and the Beatles channel in particular brings, but your different points of view is even something you think you know is fresh again. And I'm thinking specifically of Take It Away, you drop that in. Mm -hmm. and of course I've heard that album a million times. And you say, okay, because it starts, you know, Take It Away. Oh, but that's really the start of the album. And that's really when it kicks off with Ringo and yeah. Oh, I hadn't put it in that context. But in your special, yes, I did. And he, he's so understated, he, he definitely makes you feel comfortable and catches you off guard. So I said, you know, by the way, we get out of the first song and first song segues to the second one. Where have I heard that done before, right? Uh, many, many Beatle albums. And I said, and, and speaking of people who've never been on your albums before, Ringo Starr shows up and he goes, yeah, he's good. <laughs> I know, you know. Uh, we talk about the song and he talks, and I, and I asked him, you know, what was it like? It was the first time any of the ex Beatles are on one of his albums. I said, it's you know, now well over a decade past the last time you guys played together. I said, so what was what was it like musically and emotionally? What was that like putting the rhythm section back together? And he gave a very insightful answer. But you know, he, he did the emotional part first, then got into the, the the bassist and drummer locking in. And he goes, yeah. He says he's. he's you know he's listening to it in his head. He goes, yeah, we go pretty well together. <laughs> you know, it's like, 
tell us something we don't know. You know? I mean, <laughs> but tell it again. To say it was un understated, it would, be, you know, I mean, he just, he would say things like that to make it as, as you know, they had told me going in, they said they want it to be, they want it to sound like a conversation, not an interrogation, right? Um, and he was very conversant that way. It was not, okay, Paul, the next question on our list is, you know, what studio did you record this song in? We, did, we talked about the essence of the album, then went track by track, and then almost as if he's done this before, um, the last question when we were wrapping up, you know, where does this one stand, you know, among, you know, among your work for you, blah, blah, blah. He gave this great, brilliant answer, which ended with, because you know, Tom, sometimes life can be like a tug of war. <laughs> Don't say anything else. That's the end of the interview. Just end it. That's great. Um, he's that good. I mean, let's face it. He's done this more times than any of us could count. But he was, he had thought this through. He, he wasn't winging it. Um, he, he absolutely, I think he was focused because this wasn't going to be, Paul, what was it like? You know, going on the Ed Sullivan show and then playing Shay and what was the Beatle breakup all about? It was it was a, it was a you know a focused topic about his creativity, and I think he he enjoyed that exercise quite a bit. And we have another question here. It's not really a question, but it's a comment about the Beatles channel and the opportunity for somebody who thought she knew a lot about the Beatles. Uh, I now know I'm a novice after mm. listening to the Beatles channel for so long. Fat Forum is excellent, and I love. I love Tom when you do, and David, you do the deconstruction of the songs. I mean, there's so much material out there, and you'll go in track three. They did this, and track seven, they did this, and went back to track two. I love that. That's yeah. just you know. <coughs> Like you're a fly on the wall, and you're, wow, I hadn't thought about that. I mean, there's so much material, and you cover it so well, and make a novice out of somebody that's been in love with Beatles for 60 years. So thank you. Wow. Well, thank that's you. Our, that's our goal, ultimately, right? I mean, so thank you for saying that. And, and basically, the Beatles channel allows us to be in the world's largest uh, private club, basically, because yeah. we we don't have to explain why we like this. We all know right. why we like this. Well, that's, Let's yeah. go to the next step. Yeah, that's the best part, particularly, like, I know when I'm doing the Rarity Show, people who are tuning into that are going, all right, who, who's the guy that yelled B-sides before? <laughs> right. B -sides. Somebody <laughs> there, right? I said, all right, we're going to go to the, you know, the Yugoslavian B-side that was only in mono, whatever. And it's great because people will write in and we do love getting uh, your emails yes, and do. say, it's like, they know exactly what you're talking about. Some obscure part of some obscure song. They go, oh yeah, that's that's absolutely the real deal. And they know exactly what you're talking about. And then you pivot to A Hard Day's Night. Yeah. So in other words, you, when you're asking, what do you want to hear more of? You want to hear that and you want to hear that. Actually, we want to hear everything. Yeah. So you have a question here. Yes. Um, I'm a particularly big fan of your interconnected um, specials that you've done with the Beatles with hip hop and the Beatles with country. Are there any plans to do one with the Beatles and jazz? Ooh, intriguing. Intriguing. Maybe now. Boss. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would actually point out that on Apple Jam, yeah. we have played the modern jazz quartet. Yeah. Sure. It's true, oh, we have. And I have insisted on it. No, well, I mean, that's, you know, the Apple Jam is, is like I say, it's such a cool show because it's a challenge, I find, not just keeping up with David, <laughs> which is difficult enough, but, you know, there's, Give or take 30 albums, right? And you know, we're talking non-Beatles stuff. There's about 30 albums. And to Adam's point about mixing it up, but you know, you have to keep it, you, know, you have to ask, is this what we want the channel to sound like? Now we featured, I believe, everybody that was ever signed to Apple. We have played Yoko, we have played John Taverner, we have played Ravi Shankar, we have played the Modern Jazz Quartet. We have played the Sundown Playboys. We have played... Both sides. Both sides, <laughs> yeah, we've played their entire catalog. Chris Hodge, and, and of course, the biggies. We, the, the one that always gets the most feedback is the, the B is for Badfinger uh, show that we, that we do from time to time. And of course, we can mix in the Ivies and some Pete Ham demos, which really kind of keeps the sauce nice and spicy, I think. I forgot trash. Trash, right, of course. Yeah. 
Man, we have all we play her from time to time. When Lou Simon actually contacted me about wanting to do this thing with Tom, yeah. one of the things that I mentioned to him was that my my own personal history with Apple Records, the label, uh, goes back to you know buying Yoko's records when they were new, mm -hmm. and there was also I'm originally from Philly, and I was a writer there, and you know worked in the, the music community there. And there was um, a company that sort of dealt with cutouts, uh, telling them, sending them to stores, you know, buck 98, this and that. And they had somehow become caretakers of a stash of original U.S. Apple singles. And one of the guys who worked there sent me one of everything they had. Wow. So yeah. I had Chris Hodge, Trash, the Robin Shankar EP, the Mary Hopkins yeah. tracks that were not on the albums, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So my my interest in that label was really strong. And the other thing that we get to do, and again, Adam, Lou, giving us the, the indulgence to do this, we can deal with Apple Publishing, yeah. Apple Films, the Apple Studios, Fanny recorded there, the sensational Alex Harvey band, Steeler's Wheel cut yeah. stuck in the middle with you yeah. at Apple, Apple Studios. Studios. And then you have all of the artists who were auditioning for Apple and didn't get a deal, who were signed to Apple Publishing. There's a, a guy named Timon mm -hmm. um, who made some demos for Apple. He ended up being signed to the Moody Blues label, and then he recorded with The Clash on Sandinista as Timon Dog. Oh Do you see so, why I have to practice uh, <laughs> and take notes? Do you see why? That's why. Look, I've been around the that's block. Why. What can I tell you? No, that's why. But the end is, I'm a record collector too, and yeah. my collection is just from A to Z and then beyond because I'm interested in jazz, punk, metal, avant garde, rock, yeah. psychedelia, folk, whatever. Um, so I get to make these connections on the show because they're yeah. they're there. And he's, he's interviewed countless Beatles too, by yes. the way. Just oh, so by the way, yes, yes. by the way, yes. Yes. there's been one or two opportunities. Yes, yes. Many. but you know what's cool is through those um, publishing samplers and box sets, I know I've discovered, you know, some acts that I said. Wow, these guys were really good. Drew and Die. I'm a big Drew and Die. Okay, uh, Harry and I had a bet. How long would it take Tom to okay. mention Drew and Die? There you go. Well, there you go. Um, but we played as. That's a sucker's best. I know. As, <laughs> as David said, we get to play the ones who auditioned for Apple, maybe who did publishing demos. Um, one of the great thrills in the Apple Jam archive is when we got the clearance to play. Frank Sinatra's yes. demo of The yes. Lady is a Champ. Yeah. Um, you know, Round Apple, of applause for that Apple one. Gave yeah. Us, yeah. Apple gave us a green light. They said, yeah, we would own it. It was cut, you know, uh, you know, under our auspices. And um, when was Ringo, it was, I guess it was last spring when Ringo and the All-Stars were at the Venetian, um, went out there to see the band and I had an afternoon to kill and found a, a cool record store out there. There still are a few. Yeah. Um, and I'm going through this this bin of like discs that are like two for five dollars. And I see the the little green apple and the script Apple Records, and my eyes would just go to it. And the rest of the spine said Frank Sinatra, and I looked at it like what? Okay, I pick it up and I find a Frank Sinatra bootleg. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're going deep here, right? And it Only had in Vegas. And it had well, it was like at a record shop, record and bait and tackle or tattoo parlor or something um, and I found it and it turns out it was a broadcast of when, when, when we did the show so I went up and you know I gave it to the guy and said you know that's our show right there you know he still charged you for it no he no he said that one's on the house oh very good very good you got a question yes yes so happy to be here thank you and thanks for celebrating my sister Patty for her birthday. Oh my God, she goes on and on about you guys. But, no, but. question, question. Paul McCartney wrote a lot of songs, but he didn't write the music physically down. That's right. What? How was the process done? Okay. So Paul, none of the Beatles. None of. It's really one of the things that helped them, I think, in their creativity. None of the Beatles could read or write notated music. None of them. They did it on a guitar. They they played chord patterns that they liked and, said, and picked a melody out and put words to it. 
ditto on the piano. Um, in, the, in the interview, actually, um, the Paul interview, he tells a great story about how he and George Martin would do it because Paul playing it on the piano was one story. Bringing an orchestra in or a horn section, you can't just hum it to them. These are, these are the classically trained musicians who need to have the notated parts and have them arranged in a certain voicing and things. And he tells a great story, it's so good, about how he would have the idea, go to George Martin, Martin would sit there with the manuscript paper and end up being his co-writer. He'd say, well, okay, Paul, I know you want to do that on a, whatever, on a, on a trumpet, but this would be better on a French horn because this is the range of notes that you're using and that's really better for this instrument. And you really got a, a great window into the soul of that creative process. Thank you. Perfect. We have, we have time for like one or two more questions. So I, I need someone who's passionately uh, dying to ask your question. Me. <laughs> right, how about you? So I know you were saying that you do, uh, uh, I like the Beatles channel a lot. It's actually how, how I came to like the Beatles. Um, right. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I was, so you said the thing about how you do like one solo song an hour or at least one cover song an hour, you know, things like that. So uh, I was just wondering, so the Beatles songs themselves, like the 200 some songs, do you have any method to picking the, the, the Beatles songs that themselves, like the, like the frequency of, of when you play what Beatles song? Yeah, well, we want we want things to ultimately you want things to be familiar uh, more than less, right? You know, the major the majority of people out there want to hear uh, songs they know and yeah. they can sing along to. It's like going to a concert almost. Um, you want to be able to sing just about all of the songs that you go to hear, but then you want a few, you know, in between that maybe a little bit deeper, and that's kind of how we do things. So yes, we do. We do have our ways of sort of tiering songs and, you know, bigger hits, you know, a little less, a little, you know, so yes, there is a method to that. Yeah. And, and I've noticed one pattern, for instance, especially after Apple Jam, maybe after a Ravi Shankar uh, or Yoko yeah. Ono sequence, yeah. you're going to hit here a hard day's night yeah. after you bet. You bet. Uh, that Apple Jam well, episode. One of the things in radio in general is you always want someone who's kind of channel surfing and you want to draw them in. Right. And so no one's going to stick around and hang out for that 10 minutes you're in the car, you know, if revolution number nine just randomly pops up. <laughs> um, so that's why you will hear a hard day's night after something a little bit, you know, more deep than that. We, we even do that when we're already, you know, deep. <laughs> we're doing an Apple show. And so something um, next month, I heard like three people say, James Taylor, Mary Hopkin, um, you know, we're doing, uh, it's James's birthday next month, so we're gonna do, not all James Taylor, but it'll be a, a uh, singer-songwriter, so there'll be some of the singer-songwriters that wrote for Apple, wrote songs for Mary Hopkin, people you may have heard of, like Donovan, um, you know, but the James Taylor will be in there. So when we do go down the, you know, down the road of playing something that might not really be familiar to the person who's channel surfing, we will come back to a bad finger song that you know that would be more familiar. Uh, by the way, I, I compliment you on your inclusion of as much twee, specifically Mary Hopkin, as you do. <laughs> because that's where my heart goes, and I've got not only those singles but the British ones, etc. That have the B sides that you couldn't get on L, etc. So um, thank you for servicing yes. my needs. Yes. Uh, so what, oh, geez. All Beatle nerds. Well, yeah, we are all Beatle nerds. So how about one last question? Uh, Tom and David, you're great Beatles historians. And I have to ask if you got to decide Peter Jackson's next project. No hold bar, nothing off the table. If you got to decide, what would you pick? I, I got my answer. I got my answer, too. For me, it would be Live at the Star Club. If he, if he, could, tell, if he could tell Mal, his software, this is what a guitar sounds like. This is what the drums sound like. This is what John's voice sounds like. All the other junk, get it out of there and clean that up. And those tapes have been cleaned up. I mean, the first ones that came out in the mid to late 70s were really, really muddy. And um, you know, through, through the years of CD, they've been cleaned up and remixed and they found a higher generation tape. But um, 
you know, I've played some of those songs on Way Beyond Compare, and I gotta tell you, I've said this for 40 years or whatever, you know, you get your ears tuned to that thing for rock and roll Beatles, and David, you pointed it out when uh, you were with us on the forum last, we had a caller ask, can you connect the Beatles and to their influence on punk? And you went right there. Hey, I look like do one of the so that's... Yeah, yeah, I, that's I, I live no, there. But, I mean, yeah. but it's, I think one of the things that I would like to see Peter do, and actually this is more from a, like a, a film and music treatment, is the Beatles is a club band, which connects with right. the Star Club, but the Cavern, those crazy dances they were playing up in the north of England for, you know, Teddy Boys who were like breaking it up in the bar and how they actually became a great rock and roll band because they did the work. One of the things that John always said was that, you know, if you saw the Beatles live in 1964, you missed it yeah. because what they were was an amazing garage band. And I always yeah. bring this up whenever we get to play anything from the Hollywood Bowl album. Things we said today from the Bowl in 64 is, it's a garage rock record. It's the yeah. kind of record that if it had any other name on it, Lenny Kay would have put it on Nuggets. Yeah. <laughs> and listen to Ringo on those. Ringo oh, swing, yeah, right? and they get into the bridge, oh, and they're yeah. just chasing it at like 90 miles an hour. And that's why Live at the BBC is my favorite Beatles album. Yeah. That's, and we Thank play you. a lot of the Beeb, which I love because I collect BBC sessions. Yeah. Hendrix, the Floyd, you know, the Dam, whoever it is. So to have those BBC sessions on there, you really get a sense of what they were as a live band. And I would like to see that story somehow visually as well as musically, because in, in a sense, it is the missing link. That's what they tried to recreate with Let It Be and get back and couldn't quite get there. Until Peter finished with yeah. the, uh, and so, the you know, eternal uh, documentary. He can do World War One. He can do this. Yeah. 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 Oh, we have one last question from a, um, a someone who's been coming to these, yay, staging them for an awful long time. <laughs> Thank you, Rod. As a loyal listener to the Beatles channel, I love the fact that on my head I can go back to 1968 where I heard Hey Jude every hour on WABC and never, ever, ever got tired of it. And I come every day and listen to the show and I hear it maybe twice, three times a day. Always yank the, t turn the volume up on my computer in the office and I never moved the channel. I listen to those songs, and especially Hey Jude, my favorite song of all time, and I know it's Tom's also. And I just love listening to it. I, I can listen to it forever. It's just, it never gets old. And the station is really a great station. It's, it's for all of us. And if you don't have the Beatles channel, guys, get serious at it. It really is wonderful. And you guys do a great job. Thank you. Thank you. And can we do an explicit plug? And I'm serious on this. Serious about serious. In that, is there anything uh, folks who are not already subscribers should know about, you know, what's the easiest way to subscribe, anyway, stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, first uh, I would just Google SiriusXM, it'll and come then, up and go there and you'll, and, okay. you can sign up. That would probably yeah. be the best way. And, uh, and download the app, I would say. That's really yes, where, yeah. if you really like all the things that you were talking about, like all the specialty programs and going deeper and all that, there's a ton of content there. So that would be my And you can listen whenever. Yeah. yeah. So, again, uh, thank you all for sharing so much and yet leaving us hungry for more. Where's where's my number one uh, photographer? Somebody here? Okay, could you snap a picture of me?